Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to South Bay Congregational Church. I'm so glad you're able to worship with us today. Just a few announcements, and then we'll get started. Um, Light Club begins on Sunday, September 12th, so not too far away. Uh, and then um, Thursday Bible Study is going to be returning on the 23rd of September, September 23rd. And uh, we do have a topic now. Alice and I uh, figured it out the other day. It's going to be the book of Ephesians. So the book of Ephesians for Thursday Bible Study. And then uh, Paul Gibbs is going to be in concert on the 25th of September from 3 to 5 at Veterans Park in Rancho. Um, and then for those of you who hadn't heard, uh, Mary Kellogg went to be with the Lord last week. Um, I did the funeral. And um, it was, a, you know, as far as funerals go, it was just a wonderful, wonderful celebration of uh, Mary's life. Um, John Katz came and spoke who would help her publish her books and uh, uh, just the, the memories of Mary Surely missed here. Yeah. Why wasn't it published at all? Nobody knew about it though. It was uh, in the uh, online. I actually found out I was doing the funeral by seeing it on the because uh, they called me, but we, we couldn't narrow down the date and time, and I ended up finding out online uh, the big thing. I don't know why I didn't know it. I don't know. I don't know. It was on the King's funeral home book, so the day before. Yeah. Well, that's, I, like I said, I basically found out the time myself, like the day before. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Any other uh, praise or prayer requests? No. All right, let's prepare our hearts and minds.
upon your name. We glory in you, our God, our strength. You have told us to seek your presence continually, and we do that now. You have told us to remember the wondrous works you have done, so we do that now. You are our God, and there is none like you. You never promise what you will not keep. You never fail, regardless of how small and insignificant we might appear. You have a people purchased by the blood of your Son, Jesus, and you will bring them all into glory. Father, we lift up before you this morning those on our prayer list and those in our cars. Some are physically sick or have been diagnosed with a disease or have an injury. And we pray that you would tend to the pain that they bear and heal their sickness. We believe that with you nothing is impossible. And so we pray that you would restore their bodies like you do their souls. Father, some are struggling emotionally today. And so we thank you promise to be their refuge in time of trouble and a hope for their future. May you take on their burdens and their pain. May your love and your presence be the medicine that they need to heal their emotional wounds. Father, give them peace and comfort and strength to face the dead. Father, there are also some who are struggling financially right now. May you pour your abundance upon them and provide for their daily needs. You are the source of all that we possess. And so we turn now to you and ask that you bless them in their time of need. Heavenly Father, as we continue to pray for this nation and its leaders, we also lift up the people of Afghanistan this morning. We lift up those who know your son Jesus, who are being hunted and targeted by the, and being killed by the Taliban. May you provide refuge and a way of escape for them so that they may continue to spread the gospel message. We pray for all those who help our military. Keep your hand of protection upon them and grant them a path away from harm's way. Lord, as we continue our worship this morning, we seek your forgiveness for things we may have done this week that are not in your will. We pray that we would continue to walk in your path and that you guide us so that we wouldn't stray to the left or to the right. May all we do, all we say, all we think be pleasing to your Son. We pray this all in the powerful name of Jesus and God is the prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, Forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. prophet and they're not 100% accurate, they are not a prophet of God. 
And then the other uh, definition would be uh, someone who proclaims the word of God or preaching. Uh, we have evangelism. Uh, then there's pastoring or shepherding. Uh, teaching. And then there's the gifts of healing, the gifts of uh, miracle working, the gift of faith, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, both closely related. Uh, the gift of faith, the gift of discernment, speaking in tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Other gifts include administration or conducting the business of a church or leadership, leading a church. Uh, the gift of apostleship, which by the uh, purest definition, there are no apostles alive today. Uh, apostle is somebody who was chosen specifically by Jesus and who lived with him, who taught directly under him, uh, who was taught by him directly under him. Uh, that's the standard definition of an apostle. Uh, but uh, in a, today's context, uh, it would be something like uh, a, a church planter or a missionary, somebody who goes out and uh, spreads the gospel and, and plants churches and things like that. Uh, Paul called himself the lesser apostle because he didn't live at the same time Jesus said. He lived, but he wasn't called at the same time Jesus was alive and doing his ministry. He was called after Jesus' resurrection. Um, there's the gift of encouragement and giving and uh, serving, uh, hospitality, gift of showing of mercy. Those are all listed in the scripture. They're found in Romans 12 and Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, that list is not all inclusive. There are many other gifts and abilities that God gives us to serve him. You know, while some of us can't carry a tune in a bucket, we make a joyful noise, right? And uh, some haven't played musical instruments since grade school. You remember the recorder, right? Uh, others can play songs of praise, and, and, and God can, to, to God, to help us worship. You know, some of those singers can bring us immediately into the presence of God with their beautiful voices. Uh, in fact, it's not easy being an artist. Uh, it never has been. Personally, I can barely draw a stick figure, much less anything else. Uh, I do better with graphic arts, you know, things on the computer or videos or things like that. But... Uh, there is a difficulty in the art itself uh, of creating and then executing and uh, producing a work of art. Uh, then once the work is produced, it's often undervalued. Uh, people fail to grasp its message or appreciate its artistry. To be an artist is to be misunderstood. Uh, there's also the inescapable fact that most artists are underpaid. Uh, they aren't called starving artists for nothing, right? Uh, things are even more difficult for Christian artists. Some churches do not consider Christian art a, a serious way to serve God. Uh, others deny that it's a legitimate calling at all. Uh, as a result, Christian artists often have to justify their existence, you know, rather than providing a community of support the church surrounds them with a climate of suspicion. And, and there are many reasons for that. Uh, art typically consists of images, and of course, images can easily lend themselves to idolatry, uh, especially when the objects of art are brought into the church for religious worship. And I'll tell you that between my time in France and my time at the Vatican uh, in Rome, uh, going from church to church and and especially at the Vatican, you know, seeing some of the most stunning uh, architecture and the most beautiful artwork. I get it, you know. Uh, personally, I can appreciate wonderful art without praying to it or worshiping it. Um, and I don't think that's always the case that people do that. When I was young, my grandfather would always stop at the bottom of the stairs with this picture of Jesus on I have it in my office now. And he would stop at that picture, and I would hear him praying. And I knew he wasn't praying to the picture. He was praying to, to Jesus, to God. 
But that picture was there to remind him to, you know, take a moment at the end of your day and to pray, to, to pray to God. Um, and so, you know, in that case, he wasn't doing that. But there are certainly cases where people do pray to statues and pray to pictures and, you know, things like that, pray to artwork. And it becomes idolatry. The church building can become an idol. Um, when we put the building, you know, the color of the carpet, whether we're going to have pews or chairs, uh, the pulpit uh, itself, you know, the physical elements of a building, when we put those in front of reaching people for Christ, uh, we are now committing idolatry by worshiping the building. Uh, but at the same time, church buildings can and do help us connect to God. You know, it can be very important. When I walked into some of those cathedrals, you know, Notre Dame and, and uh, St. Peter's at the Vatican, I mean, they are so incredibly vast. And they make you feel so small and God so big. And uh, it, it puts you in a worshipful mood. And that can also happen in a small country church, just like this one, where you know you walk through those doors and you are suddenly in the presence of God. You feel like you're in God's house. And that's the case in our scripture reading today. Uh, in Exodus 31, 1 2, it says, God spoke to Moses, and he says, I have called by name Betel. And verse 3 tells us that God has filled him with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, with ability. Uh, the New King James uh, says with wisdom and intelligence and with knowledge and all craftsmanship. You know, and, and those are all listed in the, um, the New Testament as well. And then it says in all manner of workmanship or craftsmanship. Uh, well, what does that include? Well, verses 4 and 5 say to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, and cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. So he's giving these, the, this, this man this, this gift of metal work, of, uh, to be a, working with jewels and precious metals, and you know, woodworking. And then it says, in all manner of workmanship, well, what might that consist of? And we'll come back to that in a moment, because uh, we're going to get an idea from what they're actually going to be doing. Um, but uh, I say that because uh, Beit Allah isn't going to be doing this alone, okay? Uh, verse 6 says, and behold, I have appointed with him a holy of, uh, the son of Ashim Shemek, uh, of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. So these are like the supervisors that are going to supervise these other men as well, uh, who are going to be helping craft all of these things that we're going to see. They've been given gifts as well. And then we see what they're going to be doing in verses 7 through 11. They're going to craft a tent of meeting or the tabernacle, right? And uh, the Ark of Testimony, the mercy seat that's on it, and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and its utensils, and the pure lampstand with all its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin and its stand, and the finely worked garments, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons for their service as priests, and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded you. They shall do. Yeah, up to this point, before the tabernacle, God would come to the prophets in dreams and visions. And we talked about that a little bit last week. Or he would come to them in a cloud of smoke or fire. We talked about that a little last week. Like a burning bush, right? Um, he would come to Moses on Mount Sinai. And Moses would go way up on the mountaintop. Israel would stay down there and the clouds would form over the mountain, and then you'd have thunder and lightning, and, and uh, God would present himself to Moses and all of that. And Exodus 24, 16 to 18 describes that. It says, The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. 
And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. But then starting in Exodus 25, God tells Moses that he needs to take an offering. And uh, it's going to be for all of these materials, all these raw materials that he's going to use to build a tabernacle. A tent of meeting where God can have a place to, to dwell with and meet with the people of Israel. So he's not always, you know, just up on the mountain. Moses doesn't have to hike up the mountain every day, right? God can come, come and stay where the people are. The people can come there and meet with God and worship. Um, and, uh, of course, he's going to have to build all these things that are going to be in the tabernacle. Most notably, the Ark of the Covenant, right? But the altar, the lampstand, the, the priest's clothing, uh, all these things, uh, God gives them detailed plans and designs as how they are to be built and what they're to be built from. Um, but then we need somebody to build them, right? Because Moses is a, a carpenter, right? He's not a Jeweler, he's not a craftsman. Moses is the leader, and uh, so he 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 calls Bezalel uh, and Aholiab, and they are gifted and tasked with building the tabernacle and all of the accoutrements. Um, eventually, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, is going to be replaced with the temple which is a permanent place once they get to the Holy Land. But for now, this uh, the, 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 the tabernacle is a traveling temple. It's going to follow them around as they go and head toward the Promised Land. And uh, it was their place of worship for many, many years. I mean, they wandered in the desert for a long time because they, they got stupid, right? And but, So that was, their, that was their church for a long time. Um, and these two men, along with help from others, crafted every single bit of it from the raw materials, just as God commanded. Now, I don't know about you, but I read through those passages, and I look at them, and I'm like, yeah, no, there's no way I can do that. I can't, I can barely fathom imagining what this looks like in 3D uh, from reading that, much less be able to build it and craft it. Mine would end up looking like some third grader's popsicle stick house, right? Um, <laughs> of course, those are not the gifts that God has given me, right? But some of you have those types of gifts, working with your hands, fixing things, crafting things, sewing, plumbing, carpentry. Uh, and, and you can use those gifts to give God glory. Uh, and to, to keep his house here on earth uh, in order so that we can worship here. Whether you realize it or not, uh, like these two unsung heroes from the Bible, uh, our trustees are unsung heroes of this church. Uh, because they do things like that. I think of uh, Lila, who sews stockings for the soldiers and makes masks and, you know, does all these stuff like pillows and, you know, all these types of things. You know, that's a, that's a craftsmanship that she does to serve the Lord. Um, so as we conclude today, let me ask you, what is God calling you to do? Some of you may be saying to yourself, well, yeah, I feel like God is calling me to do this or to that. Uh, but I can't do that. I've never done that. And let me just say, well, Bezalel and Aholiab had never built a temple before, a tabernacle before, or an Ark of the Covenant. It's not like they can run down to Arks of the Covenant are us and pick one up, right? Um, but th this is the important part. God called them, but then God equipped them, right? He called them, and then he equipped them. When God called me to be a pastor, to be a preacher, that was my argument. 
preached before. You got the wrong guy. I can't do that. Uh, but God called me, and then he equipped me. There's a saying out there, uh, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the call. It's kind of a half-truth. Um, he does many times, uh, you know, call somebody and then equip them. But there are times when he equips them first and then calls them afterward. You know, you're gaining these life experiences and you have no idea that God's going to use those different experiences later on. He's equipping you as you're going through your life. So it, it works both ways. Um, but don't think for a moment that just because you don't have those particular gifts or abilities right now that, that God's not going to equip you at some point in the future. And even if you are not the one to do the building, because look, Moses was commanded to build the, these things. Moses was the one who was told, you will build these. But Moses didn't build them. Right? Beit El and Aholiah built the tabernacle and all of the things in it. But as you leave here today, as you pray to the Lord, as you go about your day, ask the question, what am I being called 